In the previous episode, we talked about aerodynamics. In this episode, we're going to discuss how we can use them to take that knowledge and apply it to create a high performance turn and to determine what kind of turn we should use to start when doing 1v1 BFM. In BFM, all you're really doing is trading energy for nose position. Hmm, I think I've heard this somewhere before. The object of BFM is exchanging energy, which is aircraft altitude and airspeed, okay, for nose position. That's what we're trying to do. You're trying to gain angles on your opponent in order to put your nose on them and pull the trigger. When making decisions in either entering or during a dogfight, you should know the advantages and disadvantages of the enemy's jet as well as your own. One of these categories is turn performance. In turn performance, there are two main variables we should know about. The first variable is turn radius, which is the distance from the center point of the arc of the circle an aircraft scribes through the air during a turn. It is a function of true airspeed and g. Without changing our load factor, our turn radius will always increase as airspeed increases. The center of our turn radius is referred to as the post, and the inside volume of the turn radius is called the bubble. The bubble is the inside of the maximum performance turn circle. When thinking of the bubble, reference it as a sphere rather than a circle, shown in most visual examples. In BFM, the safest place to be is inside your opponent's bubble, because they won't be able to point their nose at you. Adversely, you want to keep your opponent outside of your own bubble. In this series, we will refer to the post and the bubble often. The second variable in turn performance is turn rate, and it is a bit more complex. Turn rate is measured in degrees per second and can be broken down into two types, instantaneous turn rate and sustained turn rate. Both of these refer to the maximum rate at which the plane can raise its nose into a pitch up turn. Instantaneous turn rate is the maximum pitch up rate at any speed that depletes energy. In this example, you can see that as we roll and pitch up to perform our turn, all of our speed flies off the airframe and we start to lose altitude. We were able to hit a maximum turn rate of 23 degrees per second, but at the cost of nearly all our energy. If all the variables are right, the right altitude, not too heavy, full power on engines, the right speed, you'll be able to hit the maximum theoretical turn rate possible in your jet, but only for a brief moment. So why would we ever use this? Well, remember this? I'm gonna hit the brakes, he'll fly right by. Shit, he's gonna get a walk on us! Now! I got a good lock, firing. That was something you should probably never do. Well, never do it against anybody who's even remotely competent. Chances are you're just going to make yourself a high-profile target and end up dead. Too soon? The times where you want to do this are to deny a shot or as many angles as possible when defensive. If you find someone behind you and outside your bubble, you should strive to deny as many angles as possible with a break turn so that at merge, the situation will be as neutral as possible, but leaving enough energy for a follow-on maneuver. If you find yourself doing this on the offensive for any other reason, it is because you made a mistake and you're probably trying not to overshoot. There is also a concept called corner speed. This is the minimum airspeed at which the maximum allowable G can be generated. At corner speed, the aircraft can attain its maximum instantaneous turn rate. The maximum sustained turn rate is the maximum pitch rate your airplane can make, but also sustain its speed and altitude. It is dependent on two main factors, the lift to drag ratio and the thrust available. You typically are going to need to know what this speed is ahead of time for your plane. In this example, you can see that we start our turn, go max power, increase our G until we can't increase it anymore without losing speed. Now, that's not to say you can just do this at any speed. There's typically a very specific speed you can do this at, and it does vary with your weight. For example, if I try to do this at around 220 knots indicated airspeed,
you'll see that our turn rate is roughly 13 degrees per second, and to sustain this, we are pulling 3G. At 300 knots indicated airspeed, Our turn rate is 15 degrees per second at 4.7 G. And lastly, at 380 knots indicated airspeed, It is the highest at 17 degrees per second at 6.2 G. We will go over the discovery of maximum sustained turn rates in another episode, but if you want to get a head start, you can look up EM charts for various aircraft and try to learn how to read them. Now here are some principles to consider that apply from our aerodynamics episode, and hopefully you can see why it was important to cover that topic first. An increase in weight will decrease the acceleration that forces acting on the airframe create. An example, more weight, means more lift is required to overcome G, and a bigger AOA is required to create more lift, thus creating more drag because of our higher AOA, which gives us a lower top speed and slower acceleration. That was a mouthful. But basically, an increase in weight means an increase in our corner speed and a decrease in our maximum sustained turn rate. An increase in drag decreases your top speed and your sustained turn rate. Higher drag means more work for the engines. Drag can come in the form of profile, induced, or stores, like ordinances and external tanks. An increase in altitude decreases our engine performance. With increased altitude, we will have a decrease in sustained and instantaneous turn rates. However, altitude can also increase our possible top speed because of the thinner air density. Now, I know you're one and a half episodes into the series and probably thinking, what the hell, Jabbers? I want to learn how to dogfight, not just how to turn in a plane. Well, for those of you with this train of thought, you are in luck. Let's tie some of this information in. There are two basic flows that start a head-to-head -head dogfight. The first is called a one circle. A one circle fight is a turn radius fight. It is used to get inside the bandit's turn circle. It creates less separation between planes and typically the fighter with a smaller turn radius will get the first weapon employment opportunity regardless of their turn rate. In a one circle fight, both fighters turn opposite of each other, meaning one will turn left and the other will turn right. Another way to think of it is you are turning towards the bandit's nose. And when we look at this fight from above, it looks like, get this, one circle. The second way to start is called a two circle. A two circle fight is a turn rate fight. You wanna utilize your maximum sustained turn rate. It will create a larger separation between the planes than a one circle, and typically the fighter with the highest turn rate will get first weapons employment opportunity. In a two circle fight, both fighters turn the same directions. Another way to think of it is you are chasing the bandit's tail. And looking at this from above will look like, yep, two circles. Very good. Now, as far as which circle you need to use for each plane, you can do some exploring with the knowledge I've provided. Do some sustained turn rates, see which planes have higher turn rates than others, but also make note of the turn radius in each of those planes. We will likely explore each plane in more detail in the future. You can also determine what flow to use based on the closure rate between you and your opponent. For example, if you're in a flanker going 450 knots against a Hornet doing 650, your closure rate will be somewhere around 1100 knots. The flanker is notorious for terrible one circle performance. But the Hornet is overspeeding and more than likely going to have a hard time creating a small turn radius at that speed. So in this case, you might force a one circle even though it is typically not the ideal flow for the flanker. This is also why it's hard to explain BFM and what to do in each situation. There is no one right way, no one thing that'll work in all scenarios, 
and the scenarios are so vast that it all comes down to experience and knowledge buildup from that experience. I also want to make note that these flows are not exclusive to the initial merge. You will see as this series goes on that the one and two circle flows are actually more universal and applied to a lot more maneuvers than you probably think. Everything we've been discussing and seen has been on the horizontal, but we fly airplanes, right? We work in 3D space. but. We'll go over that in the next episode. If you have any questions or feedback, leave them in the comments section below and I will try to answer them. Remember to like and subscribe and I will catch you guys in the next episode.